Good evening. Good evening. Over 20 years ago, a young man, born and raised in New Jersey, returned from Howard University, hungry with the passion to stand up against injustice and the courage to fight for his beliefs. That's right. Determined to give back to his community, at the age of 24, he introduced himself to the political process by running for the mayor of this great city. That's right. Although he was unsuccessful in winning his seat, he ignited the youth and inspired others with hope to stand up for their beliefs. This young man, love for the city, led him to a career in education, where he climbed the ranks as principal while simultaneously continuing his fight for equality in our community. In 2010, after a long, continuous fight, the South War gave him an outstanding numbers and silenced all the critics that said he couldn't be elected. <laughs> From day one to the present day, he has been the most consistent, the most courageous, the most outstanding, young man of this generation. Talking about crime was a mental health issue long before Columbine, Sandy Hook in Connecticut. He was the one that stood up and came out and said violent crime was a mental health issue right here in the city of Newark. He was able to bring change to the Norfolk Council immediately after being elected, having the skills to bring people together. Today, he stands in the doorway of history, a doorway that some believe the key is to sell. Reminds me of a quote by Marcus Garvey. There is a great deal of work to do, and it calls for sacrifice, which he does sacrifice every day. Determination, because he's a determined and outstanding young man. And part of this leadership, if men believe that money could buy us the key to leadership, they are definitely wrong. Then there could be no successful achievement. I just want to let you know, this key to this doorway is not for sale. This key to this door will not be bootleg. The only way to get the key to this door, you have to earn it. And today, I will present you the key holder. He has earned the key to this door, to this city of Newark, the Honorable South Ward Councilman Raz Baraka. to me this evening. John F. Kennedy said, the problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by the oblivious realities. We need men and women who can dream of things that never were. Jose Marti, said, like stones rolling down hills, 
Fair ideas reach their objective despite all the obstacles and barriers. Mm -hmm. It may be possible to speed them up or hinder them, but impossible to stop them. Right. To Assemblywoman Tucker, Assemblywoman Spencer, Senator Ruiz, Senator Coutinho, Assemblyman, Assemblyman Coutinho, Speaker, Assemblyman, uh, well, I'm talking about people that's not here. <laughs> to, the, to my council colleagues, Councilman Rice, yep. Councilwoman Mildred Clark, right. Assemblywoman Grace Spencer, to my mother and my father that's out in the audience. Children's first team, those elected and those about to be elected. The, the mighty reverends of the South Ward. If I apologize if you're a pastor in here and you're not from the South Ward. And to my beautiful young girls that are here with me today, Raisa and Asada. My daughter, Manu, came up from Howard University. She's, she's on her way to France to the Cannes Film Festival. She's been accepted to go to a workshop there. I'm here tonight to share my ideas, not to feed the growing appetite of cynics and skeptics, but to address our realities with solutions and solicit your help in turning our frustrations into possibilities and our anxieties into hope. It is my pleasure to be here for a third time by the grace of God in February 2013, some 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation. I'm here to get you to see what I see and to convince you to believe in your city again. A few days ago, I attended a meeting with the residents of Seth Boyd Elderly and Kretschmer Elderly. The conditions that they were describing to me made my stomach turn. But at the same time, or earlier that day, the Newark Housing Authority held a meeting to discuss the choice neighborhood initiative scheduled for that entire area that will transform that entire community by leveraging both public and private dollars with a witness new housing a recreation center with education and training opportunities, as well as new transportation links that will connect this part of the city to employment and economic opportunity. And so while the captain, Venable, the sheriff's officers, special police, HUD, and myself sat around the table to address the day-to-day -day ills of a community that is long past due, yeah. we did not lose sight of how we can transform despair into optimism. Right. When I arrived at Central High School, because I'm the principal there, <laughs> and the councilman of the South Pole. When I arrived at Central High School to be the principal, there was graffiti all over the walls. Now there's poetry all over the walls. Children fought each other almost every day. Now children are fighting for what they believe in. I gave speeches and tried to mentor as many students as I could. Now there are student organizations where students are mentoring each other. Right. That didn't happen because we focused on graffiti or fights. It happened because we focused on where we wanted to go in spite of the graffiti and fights. That we never lost sight of our goals. We never stopped believing in our children. No matter how terrible the times became, we never stopped believing in our school. We must do the same thing right here. We must never stop believing in our city. And more importantly, we must never stop believing in the people of this city. So tonight I'm here to report on the state of the war 
And while like Seth Boyton, we have some incredible challenges, but there are even more incredible opportunities and incredible strides being made. Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Somebody told me that sometimes I talk too lofty. The vision is too big. People want to are concerned more about the day-to-day -day things. But if you don't see where you're going, if you don't have a place in sight, an end in mind, a goal up ahead, you will never get there. You will spend the rest of your life erasing graffiti off the wall and breaking up fights in the hallway. So I stood on this stage last year and talked about the number of abandoned properties in our ward, the unsightliness and danger of huge structures. We even identified a few of them. Since then, we have helped to pass an abandoned property ordinance that gives the city the right to acquire some 200 abandoned properties. We also sponsored and passed a law that would increase the fines and even added jail time on people in banks that leave their property unkept and unattended over periods of time. By the end of the year, we will finally have finished our homestead ordinance that will allow you to purchase some of these homes and refurbish them and put them back on the tax rolls. But more importantly, we told you that we would demolish the building on Elizabeth Avenue in Mika, and that was done. We are waiting now for the development of brand new stores on a brand new corner. We talked last year about two Osborne Terrace, and we put some $4.1 million in renovating a building that was riddled with crime and drugs, and now the building is brand new. And not, and not only that, they hire Newarkers and they hire African Americans and Latinos. Up the street on Clinton Avenue and Tim Street sits 56 more units in the Hope Genesis building. That's not all. We found $60,000 to repair Madison Avenue Playground, a playground that I played in as a boy and went there and saw that it needed to be repaired. We spent almost a half a million dollars to remediate a, a gas station on Clinton Avenue to turn it into a playground with the help of Iglesia Liberacion para las Almas, the church on the corner, the Latino brothers and sisters on Fabian Place. So much for that rumor. <laughs> we went on to find another $750,000 to renovate the old firehouse on Clinton Place and turn the keys over to Al Tariq White, Vice Principal at Shabazz and Businessman. He was once a student there, a coach at Weekway, and now is helping us run a youth development center called Leaders for Life on Clinton Place. We also found monies to renovate Nellie Greer Senior Complex. But that's not enough. We need to begin to find more recreation for our seniors. And we need to begin talks with Beth Israel so they can begin to do the great work in Newark that they're doing in Orange and places in the Central Ward so we can put care and senior housing right there so they don't have to go back and forth to the hospital. I believe in Newark, I don't know about you. I believe in Newark. With the help of the administration and BCDC, we bought in Damascus Bakery. We bought in Snack Park a lot on Freeman Heights and Avenue, provide safe and accessible parking to patrons on their way to Newark Airport, both employing Newarkers and South Ward residents. And since I have been the councilman of the South Ward, Newark nonprofits have received, Newark South Ward nonprofits have received $1,218,945. The IYO, the Center, Jackie Robinson Little League, Burger Street Festival, Newark Youth Golf, and on and on and on. When people try and tell you how bad your city is, I want you to say, I believe in Newark. On March 6th, the council will vote to pass the very first Bergen, Lyons, and Clinton Avenue Improvement District. This is the first improvement district in this area. 
in the history of this city. This will allow the businesses to pool their resources, to tax themselves, and to begin to beautify our corridors and transform our neighborhoods from broken and forgotten places to ones of vibrancy and hope. Beth Israel has agreed to give us $100,000 of startup money. City National Bank has agreed to give another $25,000 of startup money. What wonderful partners we have in the South Ward. The City of Newark has the Downtown Improvement District, the Ironbound Improvement District, the Mount Prospect Improvement District, and now Newark, welcome the South Ward Improvement District. And on Bergen Street, we heard the devastating news of lives being lost, Harding Terrace, drugs being sold on the corner, and stories of mothers who came up with the idea of organizing to sit on stoops in spots where drug dealers would be. They would go there first so they could occupy the place before the drug dealers got there. There is no building that sits there. It's called the Four Leaf Deli. It's an eyesore and a magnet for criminal activity and garbage. But on December 5th, 2012, this structure was sold to be renovated into housing and retail along with the vacant lot on Bergen and Lehigh Avenue. And it was sold to African American developers from Newark, New Jersey. So we're not talking about something we want to do. We're talking about something we are doing. And on the corner of Springfield Avenue and 10th Street, we just opened up a new key food supermarket. We talked about not having access to quality and healthy foods, and we said we need supermarkets. So we kept our promise. Go and visit and shop at the new key food. It's an economic anchor for that area, and it's employing Northers and South Ward residents. So when people try to tell you how terrible things are, you say, I believe in Newark. Please go here and shop at the Key Food. They need your support. We need more. We need more. So we have to convince the people that this is what we want. I want to say we have the best police captain in the entire city of Newark. And I'm not saying that because he's sitting out there. I'm saying that because I believe it. Yes. Captain Venable. Yes. We have worked so closely with him and the officer to the, officer to the fifth precinct. He comes to the community meetings, all of them if he can make them. He gets screamed at and yelled at and he stands there and he works and he works and he works and he works with little resources and little help, but he does what he has to do. We're happy that they opened up the mini precinct on Bergen Street. Yeah. Took some pushing, but we did it. Councilman Rice can tell you about that. We passed an ordinance to close some of the stores at a reasonable hour. Some people were upset because we closed the stores at 11 p.m. Like 11 p.m. is early. <laughs> we closed them because we wanted to prevent hanging out and drug dealings and shootings. People were getting murdered in front of those stores. We worked to pass legislation to treat violence as public health. It is now being picked up by the state legislature. We encourage the county police to help us patrol Lyons and Chancellor Avenue. And you thought you saw those county police officers because they wanted to be there. I want to thank the seniors who came with me up to the meeting of the freeholders and demanded that the county police come down and patrol Lyons and Chancellor Avenue. We talk about how our children don't have much to do and need programming to stay out of trouble. We organized, and you heard actually, the South Ward Youth Council to encourage our young people to leave. This past summer, we held two camps, two, one at University High School and
and the other at Weekway High School, named after my sister, the Shani Baraka Skills and Drills Camp. Between both of those camps, we serviced some 250 children. We also provided 50 more children with an opportunity to go to camp overnight with the YMCA. And with the help of Sandra Hughes, we are still running our South Ward Reeves because we still believe, like Dr. Johnson says, that the number one deterrent to crime is literacy. We are also proud of our senior programming. Through our senior committee that just held the second Unsung Heroes Award, it was an amazing event. The oldies but goodies dances, and with the help of the Newark Fire Department in Beth Israel, our senior fitness day. Or the fact that we gave out some 500 turkeys to help feed some 200 families with the help of our partners again, Beth, Bartlett, and City National Bank. So, when people try to tell you how great things are, you say what? I believe in Newark. I believe in Newark. I believe in the people of Newark. And I believe in the future of Newark. I believe in Newark. I believe in the people of Newark. And I believe in the future of Newark. Maybe you didn't hear me. I believe in Newark. I believe in the people of Newark. And I believe in the future of Newark. Like the assemblywoman said 20 years ago, I ran for mayor of this great city. I was not too long out of college. A young idealist fresh with the sin of unbridled change and eager to challenge the limitations of poverty and self-hatred. Here I am, 20 years later, 20 years later. And while I may move a little slower, I am no less determined and no less optimistic. Here I stand. Like Paul Robeson said, here I stand. And I am not the same man I was yesterday. And I won't be tomorrow the same man I am today. But through all of that time, I've always believed in Newark. You can say that I don't smile, but you can't say I don't believe in my city. You can say that I walk with a bop, but you can't say that I betrayed the people. You can even say that I'm radical at times, but you can never say I represent special interests in political parties. You can call me all kinds of names, but you can't say I was never a friend of the people, I never fought for the people, I don't love the people, and when you see me, I'm always with the people of this city. For 20 years, I've been fighting and working in this city. see of themselves, to intervene in a cycle of death and destruction, 
and I did all in my power to have our children choose themselves, not other people, choose themselves as beautiful, as powerful, as outstanding. I've been at Hawthorne Avenue, I've been at Warren Street School, I've been at Burnett Street School, I've been at Week Wake High School. And now, by the grace of God, I am at Central High School. And every school I went to witnessed transformation of some type. I want to tell you a story. When I was at Central High School, I met a young man, a young African kid named Oye Papula. He followed me around to various meetings and events I held for kids that were generally in trouble. This methodology I was using worked in my eyes. We held a mirror in the face of these children and forced them to deal with the reality of who and what they were becoming. Oye challenged me to try something different. He told me that most of, most of the children that received all of the attention were children that were doing the wrong thing, or those that were exceptionally smart. But most of the kids are in the middle, he said. He said, many students walk around here every day and nobody knows who they are. They don't know their name or their dreams or their fears. I spent time eating and talking with and giving privileges to many students, but it didn't really change the culture of the school. When I began to follow Oye's advice and a teacher from Weekway High School, that solidified it for me. It was then that we began to see very real and sustainable cultural change at Central. We started by wearing ties first as a test to see if we could affect the school population, and we did. Now today, there are almost 100 guys in an organization that we started at Central High School and seven other groups just like that on their way. In fact, some of them are here today, and I'd like them to come up so you can see for yourself. So you can see for yourself the work that we are doing with your babies. These boys are not bloods. These boys are not crips. These boys are not Latin kings. These boys are African American, Latino, and Portuguese students at Central High School in North New Jersey. When they tell you how terrible your city is, you say, I believe. I want you to see these boys. Because the only way you deal with rumors is you dispel them. You put the clean glass next to the dirty glass. And you let them see the great work that's happening over there. Thank you, gentlemen. You can sit back down. They're not getting any special privileges for coming here today. They came here because they wanted to. All over the state, and maybe even the country, people are talking about Newark and a video of a young man being stripped naked and beaten over his father's death for $20. It spoke to the most vile and degenerate amongst us and it upheld this perception of us as those zombies that we read about in that magazine. And they love to picture us this way. But there is no talk of Aisha Rivera, who was on Black Entertainment TV, who received the United Negro College Fund Award and is getting a full ride to go to Tuskegee University. From Central High School. There is no talk of Soroya Simmons, who received over $140,000 in scholarship, who is the valedictorian of the school and a top track star at that. There 
there's no talk of Timothy Moore, who got a full scholarship to go to New Jersey Institute of Technology, who is one of their top students still today as a sophomore there in Newark, New Jersey, who was born in Pennington Court. There is no talk of the countless young people in this city in all of these high schools that are receiving awards and accolades right here in Newark Public Schools at Weekway, at Shabazz, at Central, at Barringer, at Westside, at all of these schools where our children are. They put it in the paper to make you believe that our children are doing something wrong and some of them are, but I'm here to tell you that when they come and tell us how terrible things are, I reply, I believe in Newark. <laughs> Folks, I need your support. So I need your support, your friends' support, your family's support, because in 2014, I am running for mayor of this great city. Some 20 years later, see how God works. <laughs> Folks, and I don't want your support just because I lived my entire life in the city of Newark. I don't just want it because like many of you, I lost my sister to violence and my brother was shot in the head in this city. It would never be the same. I don't want your support because I have a degree from Howard University or a master's from St. Peter's. I don't want your support because I've been an administrator in Newark for 10 years and I've transformed schools around this city. I don't want your support just because I got a good story, because I'm a great speaker, or because I have a lot of money. <laughs> I don't want your support because I gave you food and gifts. I don't want your support for those reasons. I don't want your support because I smile a lot, because I walk nice, because you like the cologne I wear. I want your support because I tell the truth. Because I have always stood for you, and I have always fought for you. I have always taken blows for you, but most importantly because I have a vision for this city. And I want you to share in my vision and make it our vision. I know we like the story of Superman. It's a great story. It's just not true. I want you to help me to help you to transform our city. Transform it into a place that we know it can become. Let me introduce the rest of Newark to the people of the South Ward. And I know that there are people in here, we could do it tonight. There are people from the South Ward. Welcome the people from the North Ward. Welcome the people from the West Ward. Welcome the people from the Central Ward. Welcome the people from the East Ward. Welcome the people from the West Ward. I want to ignite a fire in this city and deliver it back to the hands of Newarkers and those that love Newark. 
I want, the, I want to show the world what we can do given the right chance. I want them to see what we are capable of when we are focused, what we know how to do naturally. I want them to see who we are, not as a caricature or the butt of somebody's joke, but who we are, our history, our perseverance, our richness, and our power. I am proud to be from Newark, the home of Sarah Vaughan and Amiri Baraka, the home of Savion Glover and Whitney Houston. I want to bring our city back that someone said a long time ago that wherever the world goes, Newark will get there first. <laughs> Speaking of that, in 1969, I was in my mother's belly as Newark began to organize around Ken Gibson, the first African-American mayor of a major northeastern city. This was a dangerous time. Good people of the city organized Gibson for mayor not because he had millions of dollars or because he was backed by some special interests or bosses, but because it was the right thing to do. They didn't worry about the money they had or the interest that they might upset. All they had was their courage, their beliefs, and the will to do what was right and good for the people of this city. They were tired of the conditions and vowed to change it. They believed in themselves and their ability to govern their own lives, and they believed in the people of our great city. They didn't divide themselves. They joined together, both black and Latino alike, and elected Ken Gibson to be the mayor of this city. We have to do the same thing today. We have to go to every door and every household. We want the resources, $5 or $20. We want a grassroots campaign and the same alliance that elected the President of the United States for a second time in a row. We need that same force, that same force of African Americans, Latinos, women, labor, and progressives of all nationalities, all religions, and in every language. It was that group of anti-racist and pro-working people, that democratic force that ushered in history. They understood, like the book says, that the righteous considereth the cause of the poor, but the wicked regardeth it not. It is the force, it is this force that will push Newark around its corner, that will get us over the hump. It is this force that will oppose glaring opportunism and gross amounts of finance influencing our election. It is this force that will oppose dirty campaigning and push us towards solutions and ideas. It is this force that will ensure that we take care of all of Newarkers and not just a select few of us. It is this force, it is this force the same force that drove racism and cynicism from our city in 1970. It is this force that we will, that will refuse division around nationality and demand that Newarkers celebrate their diversity and leverage its cultural complexity. It is this force that will demand that Newarkers are employed, that our families are cared for, that our schools are quality, that our streets are safe, and that everyone, everyone in the city pays their fair share. This is the real radical force. It's not me. This is the real radical force, not Councilman Baraka. He's not the radical one. It's this force that I'm speaking of that they're really afraid of. They're not afraid of me. They're afraid of that democratic, anti-racist force. The same force that drove out the Tea Party and the right wing in this country and elected the President of the United States they're afraid that we're going to wake that force up in Newark, New Jersey. And if we wake it up in this city, all of these people are going to be in trouble. All of these bosses are going to be in trouble. If we wake up that force, black, Latin, Asian, white, if we wake them up in the city of Newark, that is the radical force that they're afraid of. They want you to make it about me. They want you to make it about me so you can focus on me because I'm not a perfect man though I was made perfectly. They want you to talk about me, but it ain't about me. It's about you. It's about what you want and what you need. 
That's what it's about. And we're going to revive it. We're going to re-energize it. It's that force that keeps me every day believing in the city of Newark. Seniors that I meet at events, young children like Ashley that sung up here, like the young boy that just spoke. Those people keep me believing. Teachers that work hard every day in the city of Newark. Sanitation workers that are working 12, 13, 14 hours a day to collect garbage and get no respect. These are the people that keep me believing in the city of Newark. Crossing guards standing outside in the cold on the corner making sure your kids Kids get back and forth across the street. Principals that stay at the school to one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning to make sure your babies are safe. Police officers that drive in cars by themselves around the South Ford, knowing there's only three or four people out there to help them in the midst of danger. These are the people that I believe in, in my city of my birth, that are going to take the city back. system and ultimately our city has been aggravated by the chaos that we have defined as school reform. I've spoken with homeowners that are tired of constant increases in their taxes and lack of services. Many residents that have lost relatives to senseless gun violence or simply do not feel safe because of constant break-ins and the threat of carjackings. There are others that can't find employment and students that leave our city and vow never to return. There are many that have said it's not worth it anymore, that have lost the faith in our town, whose determination to live here decreases by the minute, about just as fast as those that have discovered Newark as a destination city, that are moving their businesses and corporate offices here, that see something on the horizon and around the corner, something that we can't see, that is being hidden from us. I say to all of you, hold on. Hold on. Yes, Newark has incredible systemic challenges. In fact, our unemployment rate is about 14%, and close to 40% of eligible adults are disengaged from the workforce. About half of our residents live about 200% below the poverty line, and less than 15% have a post-secondary degree. What does that mean? Does it mean that we sit in our homes and we lose hope? It means that our first 100 days or the first year, we have to dedicate it to securing employment for Newark residents. <laughs> Newark employs hundreds of thousands of people, but the majority of these jobs are not held by us. Besides enforcing the obvious first source ordinances and demanding that developers hire residents and that we hire them ourselves, we have to train our residents for the growing job sectors in our economy. We have to align our technical and training programs with the market. We also have to involve the school system and ensure that our students can walk into entry-level jobs that are available to them, that they have the soft skills and technical expertise to be employable when they leave high school. The state has identified at least seven areas where job growth is predictable. Almost all of these industries live and thrive right here in our city. We have six universities, three major hospitals, museum, performing arts center, arena, Prudential Insurance Company, and Port Authority, which covers education, arts and entertainment, healthcare, finance, and commerce. These are growing sectors in our state and our city. We have to leverage our assets to help foster economic development, but also train our residents in warehousing and transportation, incubate small businesses to serve as growing organization on our seaport. We have to prepare people for jobs in marketing and advertising, technology and technical support for arts and entertainment, healthcare and sciences. We have to change the way we see healthcare in the city of Newark and expand our options. We are witnessing the closing of these hospitals because of the, amount of, the enormous amount of charity care and lack of insurance. We have to begin to change our healthcare from providing care for people that are sick or severely ill to preventative healthcare. 
That is, we need more accessible care closer to homes where people live and dealing with folks before they get sick and help stabilize and care for people that have health care issues before it becomes an emergency. So we have to stop relying on an emergency room and begin to spread health care throughout our city. This helps us. This helps us to use our hospitals as economic engines for our city and expand access and develop possible jobs for our residents. And because we have the largest container port on the eastern seaboard and the third largest port in the country and growing, we should be incubating and supporting local businesses to grow with international partners and sister cities. And because about 40% of our residents do not own a car, it is crucial that we begin to organize transportation in a way that it provides access to these growing industries. People in the South Ward live about five to 10 minutes away from the airport and the seaport, but it takes them over an hour to get there. We have to connect our arteries, our communities, to the jobs that we want them to have. More jobs equalize, equal stabilized families, and stabilized families lead to better neighborhoods. I also spoke of half of us living 200% below the poverty line, and that is not all unemployment, folks. Some of these people actually do work and are making below the minimum wage. We heard our president quote the dismal numbers of those that were working, that were receiving minimum wage, but we have people in our community that are working below that wage. I agree with the president of the United States that the minimum wage needs to be lifted to a living wage. And that we have to engage employers in and around our city to pay our workers a wage that helps them not only pay their rent, but have enough left over to feed his or her family, to further their standard of living, to contribute to society with dignity and with pride. That is why the Municipal Council, under the leadership of Councilman Rice, supported a PLA agreement to make sure workers were able to have a bargaining unit to protect their labor, and that we have apprenticeship programs that will bring more of us into the steady and fair employment market. We cannot brag about how many jobs we bring to Newark if Newarkers are not employed in those jobs. <laughs> Around the news, you heard stories of the deplorable rates of violence in Chicago reaching over 500 murders annually. Even the president talked about a young lady, Hydea Pendleton, that was murdered after attending the inauguration. We have a few Hadia Pendletons of our own. In Newark, we have Sierra Lee, Central High School student killed in front of a family's home. We have Dawn Reddick shot by a stray bullet leaving a fast food restaurant. Or Officer Johnson killed waiting for his food in a corner store on Clinton Place and Lyons Avenue. Closing the stores was not enough. Opening up many precincts is not enough. We need the 100 and 67 police officers back. We need to find the revenue wherever we can, and we need to bring 167 officers and then some back to the police force. If there is anything that the mayor can do before he leaves is bring our police officers back. And because we have declared violence a public health issue and the state is following suit, I am having conversation with Assemblywoman Cleopatra Tucker to work on legislation that will give us the opportunity to present to the state that we should say that the numbers of the police should not go below a certain level given that violence is public health. And we need to follow the diagnosis that violence is public health. It is public health. In New York City, they're now discovering it all over the country. Something we knew all along. Hundreds of our babies die annually. There's something wrong. 500 people die a year in a city. Something's wrong. Something's dreadfully wrong. And so it's public health. It is an emergency. We have new town almost every year in Newark, New Jersey. In New York City, we need to follow what they've done in terms of unprecedented crime reduction and not the broken windows model 
or the stop and frisk, the things they don't talk about, the high levels of police visibility, and the fact that they use data to identify what they call impact zones or areas that are high in crime and violence, and we know these areas in Newark. They began to send targeted patrols in the identify areas, but also began to physically clean the area up. They cleaned up the vacant lots and the abandoned properties and took the graffiti off the walls. But in Newark, we want to take it a step further. We want to flood the area with mentorship programs, after school and literacy programs, job training, and family counseling. We want to support families, stabilize communities, and drive crime out. We know the crime areas in our city. There is a plan to reduce crime. We have to have it, and we have to implement it every single day. I am also aware that even though we have some of the lowest taxes in the state, many of us are concerned with the growing tax burden, particularly the one-third of us that pay property taxes in this city. The growing taxes are not commensurate with the level of services that we receive. We here in Newark want to stay below the governor's 2% cap and find ways not to raise our taxes and provide that we, what we need. And I know right now that the most popular thing is to have these meetings, to, go, to have you go around and uh, find these tax appeals and find ways to get money back. But the reality is, until we find some growing revenue and bring more homes and properties back to our tax rolls, Taxes will continue to increase, and you'll be having these meetings until you're blue in the face. That is why the homesteading ordinance that I talked about earlier is important. It gives people the opportunity to go in abandoned houses to fix them up and put them back on the tax rolls. That is why we fight for the business community to pay their fair share. That is why we demand colleges and universities find ways to help us offset the municipal government costs, at least the burden of our homeowners. Our president said this in his State of the Union speech that it's the right thing to do to get everyone to pay their fair share, that millionaires shouldn't find ways to pay less taxes than their secretaries. <laughs> millionaires shouldn't find a way to pay less taxes than their secretaries. And big businesses in the city of Newark should not get away with paying less than working people in the city of Newark. But even more important, we have to discuss the many opportunities that we have to attract new industrial and port businesses to our roles. We got to find ways to engage the state to allow us to charge a tax on all the containers that enter our seaport. We need a we need a municipal tax option that allows us to put fees on certain goods and services for a period of time targeting the over one million annual visitors to our city. And with the increase in development downtown, that disposable income will also increase. We need to get a dollar on all fares to and from the airport and Penn Station. We need to begin to collect our payroll taxes and our water bills from outstanding patrons. We have to deal honestly with the Passaic Valley Sewage Company and stop them from robbing us. And finally, we have to re-engage the Port Authority, and any governor that goes into the office needs to be on board with allowing us to govern ourselves to help us get what is only fair from an expanding airport and an expanding seaport that sits on a large portion of our land. Now, while you guys are meeting about your taxes, some of us will be meeting with the governor to get our money that these people owe us. They talk about Newark, but I say we could take care of ourselves. In fact, we may be able to lend the state some money to give us a chance. The money is, the answer is in the money we already have that's leaving our community. Leaving our community. The economic development in this city, whether you know it or not, has been bustling because of our mayor's national status and the state's urban tax credits. We have become a magnet for business from Panasonic, Audible.com, Prue Towers, NJ Pack, and many other businesses that will turn our downtown into a 24-hour business district, inviting more foot traffic and more people choosing to stay in our city for more than just a day or a few hours. In fact, possibly deciding to live here and increase our population. And while we have grown so frustrated that we are missing the forest for the trees, 
Others see around Newark's corner and are poising themselves to take advantage of our city's growth. They believe in our city more than we do. We have an unparalleled chance of using these downtown opportunities to leverage development in our own neighborhoods, to bring a diverse set of businesses and services to our corridors so we don't have to spend our money in West Orange that we could spend it on Bergen Street, to change where we live so that we don't have to transform just downtown, that we can transform our entire city. We have to ensure we are just not building beautiful structures, but, it, but that it translates into human development and community development. The word is already out. We don't have to make connections to invite people up to our city. They already come in. You don't have to have a, a college degree to invite people to Newark. They already come in. You don't have to have a special way to talk to invite big businesses to the city of Newark. They already come in. You don't have to have a special suit to invite people to Newark, New Jersey. They are already coming. In fact, they are already here. Newark will spend some $500 million a year outside of Newark. And almost 100 million of those dollars come from this part of the South Ward alone. $100 million from just the weak wake section of the South Ward alone. And I know it's true because I see you in a supermarket up there with me. But we're going to key food tomorrow. I get more conversation on Bloomfield Avenue in Montclair than I get on Clinton Avenue. So I know it's true. We have the spending power. The young man said, what's in your hand? We got the money and the spending power in our hand. We're spending our money outside of our community. If we build our neighborhoods, the more than 5,000 people that live every day in that hospital will be able to come out and patronize the businesses in our city to help them grow and help them employ Newarkers. We have to build the corridors in our community. There's no sense to build Broad and Market and not build South Orange Avenue. There's no sense, no sense to build a, a, a Mulberry Street and not build Clinton Avenue. There's no sense to build Hayes, uh, 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 to, to build Halsley Street and not build Central Avenue or Springfield Avenue. But this can only happen if we believe in Newark. We got to get rid of the cynicism. We got to get rid of the opportunism. And we got to get rid of the negativeness. This can only happen if we believe in Newark. If, yes, you have a vision. It's not enough just to be angry. Even though oppression makes a wise man mad, there's a step after that. That once you get angry, now you got to get up and do something about it. It's not enough to just go to church on Sunday. After you pray about it, you got to get up and do something about it. Well, what the heck you praying for if you're not going to do nothing about it? You pray for strength so you can get up. You pray for courage so you can fight back. Why pray for victory if you ain't going to even fight? Finally, our education system is the glue to all of this. Whether you knew it or not, the state has been in control of our system for 20 years. It's time for the state to go. We have to develop a unified and comprehensive strategy to get our schools back. We need our schools back. So we, can't, we don't want an advisory board, we want a school board. We don't want you to compromise with the state, we want them to go home. We don't want their plans, we have our own plans. Yeah, 
we are witnessing a school reform process that is not about reforming schools. We have to reform our own schools and invite good-willed and fair-minded people to help us, not hedge fund groups and special interests. We cannot put the state out only to replace them with the Broad Foundation or social media magnets or corporate profiteers. We know what our children need. Let's organize and take our schools back, our buildings back, and our children's lives back. All of this is possible. All you have to do is believe. All of it is possible. All you have to do is believe. I heard a story of a man named Nehemiah who got the news that his city was in ruin and the gates were burning in fire. He was saddened and distraught by this and petitioned the king and prayed to God to allow him to go back to the city of his father and repair it. He wanted to build the wall around the city, a great wall that would restore the city to greatness. He was laughed at and scorned. He was talked about and lied on. Oh yeah, that's a familiar story. They tried everything they could to distract him. They even posed as his friends and plotted his demise. But he, he had faith, y'all, an unbridled faith, and he believed in the rightness of his cause and the greatness of his city. And he continued to build that wall. And so I see my city in distress. And I want to help repair it. And I enjoin you tonight to help me to build a wall. And I know, I know they are laughing at me, underestimating my ability, talking about the money I got in the bank, spreading lies and filthy rumors about me, and even working to destroy me. But I'm not concerned with that now. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because I heard this story before and I know how it ends. I know that our city will, re be, will be rebuilt and I know that our families will be counted, that our work will not be in vain. I believe in my city. I believe in you. I believe in the power of us together and I know that this wall is going up. And I want you to join me in 2014 because I believe, 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 because I believe. And like the young man said, what's in our hands? God bless you and Godspeed.